You're an online coach. You truly care about getting your clients results and making an impact, but you don't want to learn sales and marketing. You think sales is a bit icky and you just want to help people. And on top of that, you're not a natural salesperson anyway. And if your coaching is good enough, then people should come and find you, right? And in fact, in fact, I think I can hear the footsteps of the hordes of people seeking you out to pay you money. Oh no, sorry, sorry, it was a plane. But don't worry, if that's you, this is the video that you need to hear right now. So it is a slap in the face from Jerome, head of sales at Propane, who used to feel like that as a personal trainer until he realized that those excuses are the things that stop you from having the biggest impact on your clients. So here's an exclusive session from our client event that will completely shift the way that you see sales and transform your bank account as well. So let's go. So before we get to like the actual sexy stuff of like how you guys sell, it's time for like a little bit of like self-reflection, kind of like we did this morning with Youssef, because ultimately if I like teach you stuff about sales, but you have certain beliefs about sales about yourself, you just do nothing with it. So we need to like challenge those a bit before we talk about the other stuff. So this was me eight years ago, PT, arms crossed, trying to look Kench in a polo shirt, like anyone else been that? Like <laughs> everyone I thought that. Yeah, so I had certain beliefs about sales, right? And it stopped me from growing my business. So it was like sales is kind of dirty. It's for like used car salesmen, um, you know, stuff like, um, yeah, I, I don't want to sell, I, I don't want to learn marketing, I just want to help people. Those were kind of my beliefs. And for a long time, like I didn't grow my business, I didn't get anywhere because of those beliefs. And I was kind of like this elephant, right? Stuck there with that stake to the ground, wanting to be better, not happy, but because of a belief around like a thing around his leg, he can't just break free and just like reach his potential. And that was kind of the metaphor for where I was at with, with my beliefs as well. So beliefs, I don't want to learn marketing sales, I just want to help people. Sales is dirty, I'm not a natural salesperson. Anyone like resonate to them? Yeah? So it's, it's fairly common, right? So my goal initially, as I said, is like just challenge those beliefs that you have about sales because they're probably holding you back and obviously show you how you can make more of them and your challenges and your DMs and your calls. First, we need to actually like, think about like, what do you guys sell? Like, just think about that for like a second. It's definitely not training programs. It's definitely not diet plans. It's definitely not accountability, community, or you know, a new skill. It's like none of that stuff. You might think, well, obviously, it's not the features. It's like the benefits. It's the body transformation. It's the health. It's you know, increasing a powerlifting to uh, total. And it's, it's none of those things either. What you actually sell is identities. And I'll give you like a little bit of context about what I mean by that. So you think you do like body transformations, but really what you do is like a future version of someone else, right? So overweight dad is finally able to take his kids swimming and be the dad he wants to be instead of making excuses on the sofa, right? Or postmenopause woman able to be intimate with her husband again, revitalizing her relationship and saving her marriage, right? That's a future version that you're selling. It's nothing to do with diet plans. Health and mindset, like obviously it's very easy to say, a beast man finally und undoes generations of unhealthy eating habits, adding a decade to his life, able to play with his grandkids, no longer feeling like the fat one. Or, you know, lady who's been drifting through her 40s with no purpose, in the depths of depression, finds herself and like builds the business that she's always wanted to be. Like it's powerful stuff, right? This is what you guys do. You might think, well, I just work with powerlifters, I get them stronger. I actually stole this from, uh, from Adam's Instagram. It's like, I take average lifters and turn them into the strongest people at their gym. From I lift weights to I'm reasonably strong. That's not just like a powerlifting title. That's like a whole identity shift, like becoming a better version of yourself. And for someone who like loves powerlifting, that is going to make them feel like 10 feet tall. That's going to be super powerful, right? Does anyone like disagree with this? Like every single one of you can have powerful and lasting effects on people's lives. Like, that's, that's what you guys do, right? Cool. So, if you agree that, then we need to like, put these beliefs to bed. So, I don't want to learn marketing and sales, I just want to help people. Or it's like, I don't want to send a DM, I don't want to like, put myself out there on social media. Same thing, really. Well, if you truly believe what you do is as powerful as we just kind of outlined there, you are robbing potentially thousands of people 
of a life-altering, identity-shifting transformation, that's selfish. I mean, to like change that belief, right? Belief two, <laughs> sales is dirty. And it is when you do it like that. It is when you sell like, based on your like, own self-interest, right? And you forget about the person you're actually selling to. So yeah, when you're selling for your reasons, not great. When you're selling someone for their reasons and you're truly governed by self-interest, it's not. And it all comes down to, are you confident you can help this person? And if you feel that way and you don't push for the sale, you're being selfish. You're robbing that person of something amazing. Belief number three, not a natural salesperson. Anyone like have said that before? Yeah? Yeah? Well, I used to say it all the time. What would you say to a client who said, well, I'm not a gym or exercise person? You'd be like, well, you don't just come out of the womb like curling fucking dumbbells, do you? Like, you, you become that through like doing the thing. And it's exactly the same with sales. So if you think this, you basically are telling yourself a convenient story to justify your own lack of action or your own failures. There's no like sales gene, right? You just learn the skill of sales or you keep telling yourself a story that stops you from helping thousands of people throughout the course of your career. Again, selfish, stop being selfish. Last bit on this, this guy, not a natural salesperson, but apparently I'm delivering a talk about sales to, to all you guys now, so. All I did, learned the skill, did the reps. It's just, it's like everything, right? That's all you have to do. So quick beliefs round up. What you do is powerful and worth money. By not committing to improving your sales skills, you're robbing people. And just like anything, like, it's a skill, do the reps, right? So let's actually talk about the skill of sales, right? So like, let's just keep it really, really simple. So someone just needs to believe three things to like, give you their hard-earned cash. Number one, they've got a problem and they believe you can help them solve it. Number two, they have a goal and they believe you can help them actually achieve it. Number three, it's a now problem. It's not a later problem. And basically your job and your challenge and your organic content, your DMs and your calls, is basically just to impart these three things onto people. And if you do that, obviously not everyone has a problem or a destination, right? And these people will sign up to your challenge on day one and be like, oh yeah, I've run out of time. Like, they just don't, then maybe they have a problem, they're just not quite aware of it. Where we need to focus are on the people who know they have a problem and a goal, but because of what they believe, they won't buy your stuff just yet. And we need to just challenge those beliefs. It's like the elephant again, right? These are your like, potential clients. They want something different, but because of this, because of these beliefs, they won't buy. So you just gotta cut that rope off, release the elephant, make the sale basically. So the three biggest like, beliefs or objections you're gonna get, like generally speaking, within your challenges, within your conversations with people are, are these. I don't think this will work for me. Basically just uncertainty. I can't afford this, finances. Number three, I need to wait until the passing of the present moon or some other like arbitrary point of time because like Clarissa just said, like most of the time it's just BS and if you really wanna do something, like you just don't wait. Like there, there's no real need to wait for anything if you want it, right? So uncertainty, these are the, the type of things that your, your, your clients or potential clients might be thinking. And like that, this, like there's a big pair of shoes there because ultimately it's about stepping into the shoes of your potential clients. And it's why people like Phoebe absolutely smash it because she's very good at that. So she knows what they're thinking and that uncertainty, that objections they might have to buying, their, to buying your stuff. So, you know, will this work with my lifestyle is the big one. I failed last time, I'll probably fail again. You really need to understand what people are thinking, their internal monologue when they're seeing your stuff. And if you can get that, solved before you ask for money, like you, you're a Phoebe basically. So yeah, minimize the uncertainty, getting into their heads, think deeply about what they think about. And it's less about having hundreds of case studies, although that might help. And it's more about believing that it works for them, right? Because ultimately they'll think, oh look at all those amazing transformations that person made, but I didn't think I could do that. And they're not gonna buy. We're all special little snowflakes basically, and that's what you gotta remember. If you don't know your niche, basically just like, kidnap them and interrogate them. But short of that, get on the phone and ask them to be brutally honest. Because if you just ask for feedback, people will probably tell you what they want to hear. Oh, some BS excuse about 
money or, you know, it's Christmas. When, if you say, Look, I just want some brutal honesty, I don't care about you hurting my feelings, why haven't you bought my stuff yet? Like, why, why won't you invest in me? And the stuff that they tell you to those, those questions, that's your gold. And if you can put that into your contents, into your DMs, into your sales pitches, like, you just go smash it, basically. I can't afford this, right. So, at the mid-ticket level, which is what we generally recommend, 100 to 200 pounds a month, there's very few people who absolutely cannot afford that, right? So if you're running into this a lot, it's basically just uncertainty wrapped into a convenient excuse. They'll rather tell you, I can't afford it, than they will say, oh, I don't think it's gonna work for me, because they don't wanna hurt your feelings. People like to be nice. Or number two, you're not being clear on what it is you actually sell in your marketing, and that's not coming off, right? So, so to kind of like explain that, 200 pound a month is expensive for a diet plan and a training program. You can get like an app that does that for like Fiverr. But 200 pound a month is extremely cheap for an identity shift to become a better version of yourself. That is cheap as chips, right? So if you sell based on features and benefits, you're gonna seem expensive, but you know, as many people have pointed out today, if you sell based on stories and identities, it seems cheap. Yeah, as we've heard today, stories sell. So lean into that story of, of you, a client, a friend, um, who's overcame the same challenges as these people want and upgraded that identity. Like Phoebe's mum, right? Like that is how, or part of the reason why Phoebe's so successful is because she's got that story that really resonates with people. And if they believe these things are actually gonna happen, they will find 100 to 200 pounds, right? That's cheap. I need to wait until, you know, whatever arbitrary point of time they wanna say. Again, like if they truly believed your program was a ticket to this new upgraded identity, they wouldn't wait. So again, it's probably uncertainty wrapped in an excuse. But even so, you probably do need to unpick years of procrastination to get someone to take action. So a way of doing that is like challenging someone or creating urgency through identity. So for example, you guys are here today, you've bought propane. Most trainers won't do that. Most trainers will just sit back and think about doing this, this thing on the internet, but not really have the, I don't know, the balls to actually take a risk and do something. But you guys have. Not only that, you've come up to Newcastle on a December cold day to build your business, because that's the sort of coaches you are. And come the new year, come the rest of the year, you guys are going to smash it, because you're proving yourself to be that kind of coach. That's the sort of coaches you guys are becoming. So what I'm doing is just, I'm not BSing you. Everything I've said there is absolutely true. I'm just building your identity up to make you want to do stuff, like to make you feel taller and actually you know, implement the stuff you're learning today. And you can do that as well with your clients, right? So before you get to the sale, before you get to the money, you, know, you get someone on the phone or in the challenge even, you can say, well, you know, you're proving yourself to be the type of person who doesn't just sit on their hands and wait for their goals to come, right? Because most people are gonna wait until after Christmas, but it's refreshing to see you don't have that mindset. And someone's gonna hear that and they're gonna feel, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I am that actually, yeah. And, and it's, you, know, you can call it manipulation if you want, but ultimately, we are getting someone to be better here. We're, done, we're doing it with their interest and we're building them up to be better. It's like you're, you're coaching. That's, that's kind of what sales is sometimes as well. So let's say, you know, during the sale, objection handling, someone says, uh, well, you know, I, I, just, I do need to wait until X amount of time. Well, you, you, you say, well, totally fair enough, but you know, you know that future version of yourself you said you want to be, right? That amazing dad who's a provider, who's a um, you know, great dad, who's, who's got his body and his life in, his, in order. Do you think he would wait until after Christmas? And most of the time they're going to think, no, nah, he probably wouldn't. And again, funnily enough, I said this to you, Tyrone, on our sales call, didn't I? Do you think the way you've made decisions to this point has got you where you wanted? And if someone has a problem, they're gonna say, well, no. Would it then be fair to say, maybe putting this off until after Christmas is like feeding into the same pan that's got you to this point? And maybe now it's time to think and act differently? Because ultimately you've got to remember the people you're speaking to are this. They want to do better. And if you don't challenge them on their BS and make them want to do better, cut off that rope, you're not serving them. So think about the elephant. So just key takeaways for today, guys. 
Number one, remember what you actually sell. Like, it's powerful stuff. Like, don't hold back on that. Number two, stop being selfish. Like, send the DM. Like, do the phone. Like, phone the person. Like, post the content. Like, stop holding yourself back. Number three, like, get in your prospect's sale. Sorry, get in the prospect's heads, and the sale is far, far easier. And number four, like, challenge people's beliefs to help them be better and just think, like, they're these pink elephants, and I need to release them. That's it. Thank you, guys. Yes. They respond to a marketing email I sent, and I have a signature at the bottom that says, like, if you're interested in coaching, yeah. um, reply order. And those conversations really often, like, drop. And I often don't get an objection. Like, yeah. I would love it if they would just tell me, like, no, I think you're shit. Mm -hmm. But I just don't get a response sometimes. Yeah. Do you know if that's, like, a sign of anything in particular? Do I just need to, like, send follow-up emails or... It's really hard to say, isn't it? Because like, it could be, it, most of the time it is uncertainty. That's the most common one. They just, they don't think what you have to offer is gonna help them. Maybe they don't ha actually have a problem that is like, they really feel passionate about. It's usually like those two things, but like you're never gonna know until you actually like speak to them. So I would just, you know, anyone who doesn't, who hasn't responded to you, I just have a chat with them, get them on the phone if you can, and ask for that like just brutal, honest feedback, and you'll get those answers. A lot quicker. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was awesome. Thanks very much. Um, no worries. Well, we're just thinking about like, some ways to get into the buyer's minds outside of the ones that you have on there. So, mm. like, you can interview them, you can listen to the objection on calls, maybe yeah. even look at like competitor reviews and see yeah. what shit's about or what's good about your competitors. Um, but what are some other ways you might want to get inside the head to figure out what, they, what their beliefs really need to be to go with you? Yeah, like, I've done a lot of like phone sales, so that, that, that's always been my go-to. Like, just actually having a conversation with someone is, is by far going to be the most powerful thing because you can hear their tonality when they say, oh, you know, I didn't buy the program because I couldn't afford it. And you'd be like, is that, is that, really, is that really what you think? Like, I challenge them a bit. Like, oh, it's because of this, that, and the other. I, 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 like the 50 solutions exercise on, in the, in the, chat, in the uh, content is another way of, of you kind of getting to those answers as well. But I just, nothing beats an actual conversation. I just don't think. Cool. Yeah. How can you tell the difference between you know, whether your offer's crap and you know, whether you're not doing the sales well enough? Hmm. So I guess if your offer's crap, no one's going to actually put their hands up in the first place. If you're getting people interested in talking to you and they're not buying, yeah, it's still the offer, but that's probably more the sales process and you know, maybe how you're kind of showing up and how you're like, explaining about that identity shift that you can get people rather than just saying, here's a training program. Because ultimately, if someone's on the phone with you and they're like, close to buying, and they don't, there's a, there's a strong chance they're just gonna like, call off, go back into their own ways. So you have to just, like, like I said, challenge someone on identity. Be like, do you, do you think like, the way you've made decisions has been working for you to this point? And ultimately, if they, if they were on the phone with you, the, the answer is always no. So it's like, well, do you think you need to make decisions in a different way? Like, and this is one of them. And usually that just like holds up the mirror and someone's like, yeah, I've been on my own way. I need to just, I need to do something. Yeah. And, and I guess because I use the same thing for my personal business role where the money is a little bit higher. Yeah. Uh, and obviously some people like, we said, you don't need to talk to my wife or like I need to check this thing. Uh, would you recommend having, what I'm thinking of doing like uh, a little bit more strict now is like kind of having case intakes are only from like the first to the fifth of the first month. Mm -hmm. So when they have the call, I'm like, okay, but this is a, it expired on the fifth. Yeah. So it kind of drives them to make that, uh, do you believe having a time limit kind of? Yeah, I think like having some, something that's like external can get people like, a little bit off the fence. I just wouldn't lean on it so much because ultimately, People are going to buy for their reasons, right? So if you can show up powerfully for why it's a now thing for them, like your, your like time restricted discount or whatever is not going to hit nearly as hard as like it's for you that you need to do this now and they're going to feel a lot more compelled to change versus oh, it gets a bit more expensive in a few days. In the team, like we, we've got like, uh, like five closes now and I, we follow or there's, there's some chat about different gurus who you follow and Everyone's got like a different way to sell. 
So I actually don't listen to many others. Like we, we get trained through Cole Gordon. Do you know Cole Gordon? Yeah, we, we get trained through him. I just listen to like one voice, one person, because if you go to like all these different people, it can get a bit convoluted. So I just pick one person who fits the way you like to sell, the way you are as a personality, and then just, just make what they do, kind of your Bible if, if you're learning it. Yep. Um, of course, like if you are undoing someone's pattern of, of thinking and acting of however many years, and like they've finally undone it, there's going to be like a strong risk for like a couple of weeks at least that they're going to want to like back out of that. So I think that's more about like your onboarding process um, and how you make them feel supported and how also like the coaches, who, whoever takes over from, from you or if you are the main coach, that you just sort of reinstill that you are changing a pattern of a lifetime and that's not going to come easy. And it, it's all about just truly believing that you can actually help this person and, and just holding them to account of what, what they really want. I guess if someone's leaving because they, they have no money and you could, down, you could downsell them, yeah. But if they're leaving because it's not working for them anymore, like 50% off probably isn't going to make a difference. So I'd find out why they want to leave. I'd find out what the objection is ultimately before you just you know, chuck a discount at them. Time would probably be better spent on new lead generation and nurturing guys that are working as opposed to trying to hang on to someone who's already trying to run out the puppy door. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you don't want to come in and be like, oh, I, you don't want to come across as almost desperate to have them as a client, right? So I think, and you don't want to devalue your service. I think a really great thing to do is just deflect on them. Like, okay, what do you need right now? Often frantic, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, therefore, you need this because you don't know what you need. And I'm providing you with these support to meet your needs. I'd say so, yeah. All right. We have people who join Propane who they opt in for uh, like the, uh, was it, what, what are people opting for? Uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like after the, yeah, they opt into that and uh, Alex gives them a call and like they, they book in with us a few days later and they end up like joining. They wouldn't probably have never have done that unless Alex actually picked up the phone and booked them in. Like they probably would have just put in like, yeah, procrastinated on it. Um, <clears> when you're calling, yeah. do you ever leave messages or if you, if you get, if it rings out or gets cut, you just leave it and then we typically like double dial because like if you get one call you know like, who, who's that you just be like leave it but if it's twice people are a lot more likely to actually take it seriously so we we generally double dial but i, I don't, don't leave messages generally and if someone like again with the frame of i know this person really wants my help i know they're in their own way like and i'm not following up with them like a couple times a week at least until they tell me like fuck off basically, I'm not interested, which is cool, yeah, fine. Then um, again, I'm not really doing them a disservice, really. Yeah, people are busy, right? You've got to remember people are busy and if you just give one opportunity to respond to you, you're like missing out, so. The harassment thing seems to be something that a lot of people are worried about, but I would attempt to park that like ethical objection with the fact that they came to you yeah. to a point. So you're not, you're not cold calling these people. Right? Yeah. No one has the right to feel upset that you're phoning someone when they gave you their fucking phone number. So if they opt into something and then you're using that, it's like, why are you calling me? You gave me your number. So they have no grounds. And you'd be surprised, it is much more so. I think there's a bit of a disconnect. They will experience the fact that they're just busy and they're hectic and they're doing something else. Whereas you'd be like, God, well, they didn't pick up, they hate me. So it's like, I just, I, I have, I'm a bit of a wanker anyway, so I don't really care. But I just need to be proof that again, they did, they did come to you. They knocked on your front door. Yeah, it's fine. Tyler Taylor uh, evidence of this. Like, you, you guys outreached us, yeah. and you were great. Enough. Like, I, you didn't take it personally that I was pying you off. Like, you, know, you, you were like, it's probably busy. Hello, Yusuf, are you still there? I did find myself to sleep that night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, yeah, like, here, here we are. You come up to Leeds, two grand package, and it's like, come from an outreach message. Yeah. I appreciate you guys. Just off the back of the, this would be good for ex family member, ex friend, ex whatever. When I <coughs> do sales stuff, I want to call, what's their number? We'll make a group chat, make a group chat with them, then with them, and say, why do you think this would be good for them? Whatever they write, put that in a message, send it to both of them. So there's no like, you've got the permission, and you've sent the message. 
Jim said he'd be perfect for this program because of X, Y, and Z. Here's my number. If you want to chat? Yeah. Spot on, and like there'll be just like instant level of trust with that, right? So that's a great idea. Cool. All good. People feel differently about sales now. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Thank you. As always, if you want to see how all of this fits together, the sales, the automation, the tech and everything to build an automated selling system for you to get 30 clients over the next 90 days, then click here and we'd walk through the entire thing. Oh, also, if you just want to jump the queue and chat to us about working together, then click on the link below.